Hello. Awesome. Okay, I think we're live. Everyone just, uh, sorry, I'm just going to mute myself on my other laptop. Okay, can everyone hear me still? All good? Awesome, great. Felix, I'm just going to test the screen share with you. Let me know if you can see my keynote now. Yeah, looking good. Okay, awesome. We'll just wait a couple of seconds and then we will jump straight into everything. Okay, awesome. What have we got? Cool. So everyone can see me, everyone can hear me. Um, just add a comment if so. Great. Hi, Annette. Thanks for joining. Bastian, great. Hi, Magdalena. How are you? Thank you for joining. Hi, Roman, Hugo as well. Howdy to you too. Awesome. So great. A couple of quick points we're going to cover before we before we jump into things. First thing is you might hear my have a little dog sleeping here. She might bark at some point. So if there's a very loud sound, then then uh, that will be her. Second thing, just ping me. I'll be watching the comments on on my laptop over here. Um, so if there's any issues with the audio or video. Just let me know on there. Unfortunately, I don't have an assistant today because uh, he is also under quarantine. So I have to be sort of managing this myself and trying to keep an eye on things as we go. Third point, so onto the actual structure, the format to, of today, we're firstly gonna be exploring the challenges that um, COVID and, and really the coming recession will uh, cause for us. Secondly, we're then gonna really delve into what, really, what separates good from great product leaders. And thirdly, the work we're then gonna look at an actionable three-step process for building adaptable autonomous product teams. And after I speak for about 30 minutes with a, a lovely pre-planned presentation, we'll then uh, open up for questions. So point four is any questions you have uh, throughout, as I said, because I'm sort of managing this myself uh, if you join late or, you know, if you're a bit lost, then Felix will, Felix Howes, who has just welcomed you all, he will be uh, trying to field any questions throughout. But generally, just save them for the Q&A we'll have after. So we'll have 15, 20 minutes afterwards. Um, if there are no questions, then obviously we might shorten that, but hopefully you have, have some questions. And finally, um, just to motivate you to actually stick with this to the end, I'm sure you have, well, maybe don't have busy evening plans if you're stuck at home at the moment, but... Anyway, just as an extra, extra incentive, we are going to be offering free strategy workshops for anyone interested. These are usually priced at around 3,000 euros. Um, really, this is our way of, you know, we understand um, companies at the moment are facing massive change and cutbacks. So this is really our way of trying to contribute and try and help out in some way, let's say, to, to companies at the moment. Uh, I blocked out sort of a limited, limited number of sessions in my calendar for these. So at the end, just move quickly. We'll be posting a link and uh, you can book a session with us through there. And finally, um, as a product person, really, really important, we talk about outcomes. The outcome we are looking for today is really to provide you with a playbook for guiding your product team, leading your product team or product organization uh, through the uncertainty of COVID-19 and more importantly, actually, the, the recession that will be coming after that we are really already in and not just to survive, but really thrive as we move forward into um, 2020. So without further ado, I'm just going to screen share with you and get this keynote up. Let's get thriving. Great motivation from Felix. <laughs> Excellent. OK, so. Um, one second, let me just get this up and running. Final sip of water. Excellent, let's jump into it. So your first week of remote work was probably quite exciting, right? You have these remote happy hours, we did one ourselves. Um, you're learning new skills and there's really been this visible sense of community, which I imagine everyone has also seen in there. The companies, right? This, this sense we're all in this together. But now that we're in week two, we need to actually start thinking about the future. We need to start delivering results. And you know, when you all worked in the office, um, you could just about keep things under control without much process. 
right? Because we had touch points with everyone in our team on an ongoing basis. And I think now, now that you're, you're working remotely and the economy has radically changed, the cracks will start appearing uh, if they haven't already, right? Remote sort of exacerbates problems because in a remote world, those problems of miscommunication, of lack of direction, of unmotivated, unempowered teams will get a lot worse um, very quickly. And without a framework for adapting, for identifying new opportunities, for seizing those opportunities, uh, teams will simply not, not adapt and not, not act. Uh, they're just going to, you know, do the same thing that worked before the crisis, uh, but now without the res without the same results. And really important to remember that if you are not doing enough, sorry, it, it is not enough to sort of just be clinging on at the moment and doing the same old thing, because as I said, the market and, and the world um, has changed. And yeah, at the moment, you know, I th the, the theme really seems to be obviously because we're, we're early in this crisis. There's an, an obsession over which remote tools we're using. You know, when are we holding our remote tools? Uh, sorry, remote calls, for example. And um, you know, sure, working remotely is this new challenge, and it's a big challenge. It's a very real challenge, but it is um, just part of of our work. It's part of how we work. And actually, the big thing. What really matters and what we'll be covering in this webinar is having an answer to this question. Right? How are you going to deal with the uncertainty and radical change that you will face, you and your team will face for the next 12 to 18 months in a hard recession? Um, and let me introduce you to, to a common product killer. And sorry for the wording of this, but I think it's the, the right word, obviously. Things going on in Italy, Spain at the moment. Um, what we call those sort of product uh, death spiral, uh, which is really in times of high stress and crisis, particularly, this uh, becomes more common than it already is. Right? Essentially, when we talk about the death spiral, this phenomenon, it's really when product leaders ourselves become overwhelmed. Uh, it's when we tend to throw out good product process out of the window. We stop exploring new ideas or opportunities. We stop measuring the outcome of our experiments, of a new feature we just launched, for example. And instead, it's very easy to go into full reactive mode. You know, we push our teams to build whatever our CEO or marketing or sales requested uh, as they pressure us to, to build you know, their request because they themselves are feeling the urgency to deliver results. Uh, everyone in the company wants to deliver results. And it's easy to stop asking why and instead jump straight to how and by when. You know, how do we build this? Um, when, when is it going to be built by? So we start micromanaging and breaking down the complexity of tasks, but stop thinking about whether these are, in fact, the right tasks to even be working on in the first place. So we just try to push out as many features as possible, as quickly as possible for as many stakeholders as possible. You know, we, we, we forget what our purpose is is as product leaders, as product managers, which is to build teams that deliver value to our customer and value to our business, not to please sales or to please marketing or our you know, CEO's latest untested uh, idea. And in this death spiral, where nothing is well-defined, uh, everything is rushed, we never stop to measure results, to, to really learn from our work and to see what delivered uh, value or not. And as we deliver less and less value, crowding our product with you know, mediocre or, or just useless features, we start to lose our customers and we start to lose our revenue. And obviously the fewer customers, the less revenue, the more the urgency and the, the panic within our product team and our, and our company steps in. So the deeper we go into you know, the, this, this death spiral uh, and it becomes a vicious cycle. But um, you, know, you may be saying like, well, great, you know, this, this is nothing new. This, this has always been the case. And you would be completely right, right? Good product management has always been about delivering value, about advocating autonomy, ability to adapt, of focusing on the right opportunities and, and building the right thing. You know, if we take Marty Kagan, the, I, I personally consider him the godfather of product management, he says it doesn't matter how good your engineering team is if they are not given something worthwhile to build, right? i.e. if we are not building something that is delivering value. The big difference, though, now is that what we could we could get away with bad product process before, 
uh, you know, the funding was there. But now it is urgent and essential to your survival as a product team to adapt and follow effective product process. Because when we are in that death spiral, we are burning through money rather than moving towards value creation, right? Obvious point. And in a crisis, we can't be burning through money. We can't have expensive development teams. We can't have a bloated sales team. We can't not be delivering business value, right? We can't not be delivering revenue. And, you know, as has, we've already seen it with sales, if you simply go on LinkedIn, the amount of salespeople that are out of a job, um, that trickle down will come to product. And your CEO your, or your boss right now is seeing cash burn down, right? If, if we are not delivering value. And there is, um, unfortunately, a half, harsh to half, harsh truth um, in this situation that we need to confront as product leaders, which is, you know, how long can a situation like this continue for? Um, if we're not de delivering value, when will you be forced to fire your team? When do you get fired yourself for not delivering results? And even if it's not your fault, if it's your boss or your head of sales or head of marketing, you know, pushing you to, to work on what they want, who is ultimately responsible for your product or product line is you, the product leader, right? the product lead. And when the finances just don't add up, uh, you know, this cycle has to end at some point. Um, and again, just to, to, to reiterate the point, this has always been true, but there are three factors now that have come into play that make this become even more urgent. So again, one, you cannot micromanage when you are not in the same place. You can't afford to be disorganized and reactive and, and unable to adapt just because you are remote. And that won't be saved with happy hours on a Friday and check-ins with your team. It's not enough. Secondly, we are entering a recession. We are in a recession. Your company cannot afford for you to be working on products or features that do not solve customer problems. Right? They don't have the money to bankroll uh, your team. Thirdly, and this is a really important point, uh, particularly coming into this post-quarantine phase uh, in, a, let's say, a month, two months. Right? The world has changed. Um, you can't now plan long, long roadmaps. You can't have a big backlog because we can't predict the outcomes of what will happen next, not in the short term and not in the long term. We don't know what the second and third order consequences of this crisis will be. And if we try to predict outcomes by you know, taking lots of input from our teams, planning a three month roadmap, you will almost definitely spend your time, your team's time on initiative, sorry, on initiatives guaranteed to fail. So that spiral will, you know, go on and on and will accelerate even with this loop of no value being created um, and really a, a ticking time bomb for your, sorry, for your job and your team unless you break out that loop. And, you know, as I said, in a recession economy, sorry for the wording on this again, um, you know, considering Italy, Spain at the moment, but it is the only phrase that can hammer the point home, right? We need to adapt or we die as a product team and as a business. And busy work, micromanagement, trying to please all of our stakeholders won't save our product team in the coming months. And really only product leaders with a framework for empowering their teams to act and who can really adapt their leadership <coughs> will, so, oh my God, sorry, my dog. <laughs> Funny. So I'm just gonna check in, Felix, you still able to hear? Everything's still working? <laughs> Yeah, I have to deal with that a couple of times a day. Awesome, great. I'm going to jump in then again. Excellent. So quick intro to, to me. I'm Henry, CEO and founder of Product Master. And um, ever since I started my first business, actually on a solo trip down the Amazon in Brazil, uh, eight, eight years ago or so, um, and really seeing that business fail spectacularly two years later, I've been really obsessed with sort of understanding what makes some product teams succeed and others fail. And I've spent most of the last seven years really pondering that question, uh, publishing a book last year called Why Your Startup Is Failing and working as a freelancer and consultant in uh, various product roles as designer, product product manager, and now had a product um, uh, across Europe, actually, and Brazil. Um, in this presentation, I will provide you with a framework to build adaptable outcome oriented teams to empower those teams with effective leadership and thirdly, not just survive, but really thrive during this crisis. 
So I'm also going to be covering um, the biggest mistake I think leaders make when moving to remote. The two things that, that separate the good from the great when it comes to product leadership. And thirdly, we'll be covering a, a simple proven three-step system that, that you can actually put to work immediately for empowering your teams in practice to be adaptable, to be autonomous and really pursue uh, results. So there are two types of product leader that, that I've really seen in the market. Right? We have the, as I said, the micromanager, somebody that controls the data, leads with fear, uh, stresses when teams maybe diverge from, from a predefined backlog. And these people generally focus on output. So how many features are we getting done and how quickly? Secondly, there's then the visionary, somebody that understands the business, understands the main opportunities that could be pursued for that business and who empowers teams to seize those opportunities. Somebody that's focused on outcomes, i.e. are we delivering value or not? And really when we look at what separates these two people, there's one key thing. And if we can learn and really apply this one thing, then you and your product teams will, uh, as I said, not just survive, but hopefully thrive in the coming year. So I'm gonna give you an analogy to really hammer this point home before we get into the substance of this presentation. This is not a great, imagine it's a greyhound. <laughs> so your teams right now are, in a lot of cases, are gonna be sitting at home, worried about the state of the world, worried about the state of their company and unclear on what to do next. All right, so they either do the same as before, because they haven't been shown direction, or they do nothing, right? They, they become paralyzed by inaction, paralyzed and unclear about what the next step should be for them. Um, and many teams that I've observed feel like they're on a leash because that's how they've always been managed. They've been micromanaged. If they are asked to execute something, they'll execute it, but they don't want to take the initiative um, or they don't know how because they might have tried once, but you may, they may have been shut down by yourself or another you know, manager within your company or someone else within your company. So many people simply stop trying. So you, so you have unmotivated teams that are unclear about how quite to, uh, how quite to move forward with it. And it's not about teams being lazy or, or uncaring. I think this is never actually the case. It is just that teams may feel particularly at the moment so uncertain about what they could or what they should be doing that they default to, to the old normal, right? They do what, what they may have done before. And on the other hand, when we've observed high performing teams, you know, if you give them a clear goal to pursue with a framework, so if we look at the barriers around the racetrack, they will go full speed, full energy at whatever goal is set and work out the best way to, to win the race, right? To get to whatever objective is set for them. So if you give them autonomy, give your team autonomy to pursue that goal, teams will put everything into achieving it. On the other hand, giving them a list of tasks to complete um, and they're going to slow to a walking pace because it might not make sense to them or they don't care because it's not their ideas. And again, this is nothing new. This is not, um, you know, an enlightening statement to me. Humans have always craved purpose. And we, when we look at good product teams, these are traits they have, right? objective, but freedom to work out. But this is now more true than ever. It is really essential to the success of any team moving forward because, you know, your employees are worried about their job. They are worried about the future of the company and, and obviously worried about the state of the world as well. There is a new urgency, um, a clarity of purpose and, and really a necessity that people understand, right? People are not stupid. Uh, you know, it, it's not about an experience. It's simply about direction. They know the business is probably under threat that the economy and customer needs have changed. So give them purpose and point them in the direction and they will show you they can uh, deliver results. And I think really important to let that point sink in because it is the opposite of how many leaders act, many teams act, particularly in times of crisis. Um, it's easy when we feel overwhelmed or or panicked or you know unsure about where to go next, when we're suddenly in, in a um, feeling a sense of uncertainty, that it's easy to default to obsessing over the details, to take autonomy and purpose away from our teams at the moment, we should be giving it to them in, uh, you know, as much as possible, uh, because we feel this, this, this need, this attempt to sort of control the situation and an attempt to deliver results. And, you know, until now, that approach of, of micromanaging has just about worked. As I said, 
you can just about drag a team in the right direction. But um, really, the game has changed. And without a framework for making decisions, teams are just going to be paralyzed by an action or wandering around in every direction and not moving the company to where it needs to be. And to survive or to thrive, uh, you really need a team of greyhounds within that, that framework, right? our, our racetrack, um, for, for them to really go at whatever objective you set them. So you need to let your teams loose so they can really work out how best to reach, reach the finish line, and put all of their skills, all of their experience, all of their energy into actually getting them. And that means focusing on the things that really matter. So video calls and our weekly happy hour, our you know, home office setup, these things are important. Um, they help us get stuff done, but it's not, they aren't the most important thing. Instead, we, we need to be focusing on adaptability, autonomy, really delivering results and understanding you know, what our goal is as an individual, as a team, and us as product leaders providing a framework for that. You know, those are the things that really, really matter and really change the game. And you know, to become a visionary, we there are two skills that that, that I've observed. Uh, I'm sorry, observed at least. Just gonna have a sip of water. Two skills I've observed. So, firstly, we have this ability to identify opportunities. Secondly, actually building teams or shaping teams to seize those opportunities. And again, just really reiterating this point. If you cannot deliver value with your products, those products do not have a future. And this is more true than ever before. Um, and we need to very quickly as product leaders identify new opportunities and deliver value in the new economy. So how can you actually thrive in uncertain times? We need to be focusing on two activities, identifying big waves and catching big waves. This is an analogy. <laughs> so identifying big waves first. What's currently happening in most product teams is this, right? Teams are paddling, and again, this is true before, more true now. Teams are paddling where there is no wave, or where there was a wave before um, that may have dissipated, right? May have dropped off. So throwing resources into bigger product team, more sales, more marketing budget, et cetera, trying to force an outcome, right? trying to force some sort of speed, some sort of momentum, but where there isn't a wave. And it may have, uh, you know, may have worked before, but again, is not gonna be working now. But really what we need to be doing, particularly in our role as product leader is this, watching for new opportunities, seeing what the, you know, not just what's happening under the, the quarantine, what's, what instead of the second, third order consequences, what behavior changes will we see? Shout out to Connor for this point for our chat last week. <laughs> you know, watching as these, these previous waves die out and they lose their energy and, and really looking towards the horizon to see what's emerging. Because as I said, a recession is you know, a, a crisis, but it doesn't mean everything will shrink. It means a shift in the economy, a shift in opportunities, and a creation of new opportunities. And if we are watching for big waves, we also need to be ready to catch the right wave when it comes, to build a product team and launch it forward as the wave arrives, to adapt, shift our weight, uh, to ride the wave into shore, to, to you know, really deliver value to our customer, by seizing that opportunity. Uh, and when we, as I said, deliver value for our customer, we can then deliver value for our business in the form of revenue. How do we do that? Well, with a tried and tested three-step process, which we will cover now. So step one, really what we're doing is breaking those, those two steps down into actionable steps here. So firstly, we need to be asking ourselves, you know, what is still true? What has changed? How and how are we carving out time to develop new insights? How are we keeping you know, one eye on the, on the long term? And to do so, we need to take action to be actually exploring new trends as they emerge to identify potential opportunities, either within our market or even outside of our market. Right? We need to set that aside as a priority to spend time doing. You know, what is happening on forums? Uh, have we sent any surveys out? What are people saying on LinkedIn, on Facebook? How has customer behavior changed? What about um, customer feedback we're receiving? Any conversations we've had with customers? And how we may be aggregating all of this, this new data because it is new, right? It's, there's a watershed point from last week, 10 days ago now even. Um, and then more importantly, how do we actually take action? Because I know for myself and I know for, for 
every product manager ever. <laughs> we are busy putting out fires, keeping everyone moving, you know, managing different stakeholders, and, and we can't focus on your opportunities full time. It's unrealistic to do so. We need to get buy-in from, from management as well as the you know, product teams we're working with. Right? So it's a difficult process. Um, and as I said, we can't radically just simply change everything at once unless we work in a very small startup when I would definitely recommend doing that. So instead, we need really a framework to quickly align key stakeholders and move from ideas to action. And in our experience at Product Mastery, the, the most effective way of doing that is using something called the Lightning Decision Jam, which is essentially a one hour workshop designed to you know, align us around a specific challenge and move towards a solution to test out. So we have a watershed moment, a moment of clarity when we get the right people in the room to work out what we need to focus on. An example could be, you know, aligning our team around a need for a re new revenue stream. Maybe our previous one has dried up and we don't think that will change in the coming months. Um, we would then assign, you know, one of the team after that workshop to maybe explore a few different new areas, a few different areas of potential. And because we've aligned management, you know, we've got the right people in the room with this uh, framework, because we all understand the business challenge, we get the right people in the room because we are able to prioritize and assign the work within that one hour workshop, it means it actually gets done. It actually gets prioritized and decisive action is taken. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail on this again because we will actually be covering this, sorry, my phone just pinged. We'll be covering this at the, the end. Uh, this is something we'll be, we'll be offering uh, free for, for everyone that has made it through so far. So as I said, step one, we're watching for waves and we do that with a one hour kickoff meeting to make sure it gets done. Step two, well, it's great to look for opportunities, but also we need to be catching the right wave. Again, it'd be easy to have a knee jerk reaction, for example, and uh, you know build, let's say a remote tool, but maybe people go back to work in a month, maybe in two months. Um, maybe remote work didn't work for 90% of companies and, and actually it, you know, it sets remote work back for a while. We don't really know for sure what's gonna be happening longer term. So we need to be open to, to different opportunities. Hi Claudia, sorry, just seeing your message there. We will cover that um, at the end. So sorry, I'll, I'll note your question. Just remind me at the end of the, the webinar and I'll, I'll jump in on that question, but very good question. Very relevant right now, of course, as well. So sorry, back to this. So step two, um, when we talk about the, yeah, yeah, Darius, that'd be perfect. That'd be great if we cover them at the end. I'm just gonna get, because I've, what I've done is assigned 20 minutes or so, so we have a, a long time to cover it. Feel free to post questions though on, on the side whilst you remember them, we'll, we'll scroll through them. So, so however, however you want. Awesome, sorry, so step one again was watching the waves and actually making sure we take action to, to prioritize this. Step two is really identifying the right wave. So when we think we've seen a, a big wave, right, a big opportunity, how do we actually act quickly to validate that it is in fact a, a big opportunity? Because we don't know that, it is all assumption. Again, in a world of uncertainty, particularly at the moment, we um, need to, yeah, we need to be testing that. So one second. Or for example, how do we also free ourselves from the opportunity we're currently committed to? That's a big question for people who are actively working in companies currently. Again, we can't radically just shift things unless we're in a four or five person startup. But two common mistakes I see before we jump into why we, we also run a workshop for this step is firstly, it can be very chaotic to shift strategy completely. Right. So even if we have a very clear direction opportunity, getting people aligned around that can be very difficult if we don't have a clear moment of transition. Um, or alternatively, teams try to jump sort of straight into a lean product development cycle. So setting out a hypothesis, committing to an MVP, right, minimal viable product already, and testing that. But because that process tends to drag on, so, you know, we're testing something that takes a month to build rather than a couple of days or even a couple of hours, there is a bias where we start committing too quickly to a certain direction because, you know, if we're spending a week, two weeks, a month working on something, then it becomes psychologically harder to uncommit from that. So we need to prevent that happening. And that first version, it's very easy if we jump straight to building MVPs to um, let too much complexity creep in, too much discussion, 
And as I said, to really default to what should be the minimal viable product becoming simply the product. And we never, we never take a step back from that. Um, so, sorry, one second, let me grab my notes again. So again, yeah, to, to avoid that slide into really committing too early to a problem that might not make sense or to avoid sort of going in circles by endlessly discussing ideas, we need to take rapid, uh, decisive action to, to shift gears without sort of rocking the boat too much. So to do that um, at Product Mastery, we, we've learned to really try and apply the design sprint process. This is a workshop structure developed by Google Ventures really to, to quickly move from understanding the problem, building a rapid prototype and actually validating that prototype through testing within three to four days, rather than jumping straight into a uh, lean product process. So rather than taking sort of weeks or months to validate that we're onto something, that we've we found a big opportunity, we um, so are trying to validate a prototype as a side project in our, in our free time because we're busy. Um, we just set aside a few days to really very, very quickly move from identifying a new opportunity to validating that opportunity. And also really importantly, I think in, in again, in the added uncertainty of where we're at currently, 2020, moving quick, moving very quickly from opportunity to validation is going to be a massive competitive advantage. Most companies, firstly, most companies are not gonna be following any sort of iterative process. They'll just put products out there and hope it works, which rarely does if we look at the stats on that. Um, however, even those following a lean product process can commit months to an MVP or at least a couple of weeks to it. If, however, we become very effective at moving from idea to validation within a couple of days, we give ourselves a huge chance of um, running successful product or forming successful product teams. So I'm just checking the comments quickly. Yeah, very good point, Magdalena, and I will come to that at the end. How do you think current president to do? Yeah, Mamad, it's something I've been thinking about a lot, and I will come to that in about five, 10 minutes. Not too long left that you hear me just whirring on. <laughs> I think about five minutes, and then we'll jump into questions. So step three, I think, once we've actually you know, validated our idea with a, a short, sharp design sprint, and we've proven that we're, we're onto a big opportunity or that actually we need to try something else, um, we can actually finally commit to, to building a full solution, right? this proper lean product development cycle, where we should be defining a hypothesis, building live prototype, measuring the results and learning from that. So we have our build, measure, learn loop. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into this in, in, in detail because I think it's relatively common, the theory of this. What's not common is the step one and two to sort of set ourselves up to make this build, measure, learn loop really succeed. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why, one question may be, you know, why bother with step one or two? Uh, that for me, my learning has been, they've been so, so important because one huge advantage of this design sprint process is that we already have a cross-functional team ready to work on the new opportunities. So if we go back here, if we immediately jump into trying to go like, shit, we need to you know, change and, and change our product and actually move in this area, it's very difficult to grab those resources together. Whereas if we've done a three to four day workshop and we have you know, someone, product manager, maybe CEO in there, someone from sales, someone from marketing, a designer, we have a team with the skill sets to, to act autonomously who have all bought into this. And, and you have the skill sets that, that allow you to really adapt quickly in order to, to um, you know, pursue whatever challenge, whatever objective you set during, the st during step two here. So that when we get into our feedback loop, our build, measure, learn loop, we have the skills and we have a very clear direction that we're going to be moving in, which allows us to adapt to that. And you know, in, in this case, really our role at this point is simply to help that team continue moving towards whatever objective we set during the design sprint to have a metric to measure success so we can you know see how we're doing <laughs> and to introduce some sort of simple framework to follow that again I'll, I'll cover this in the question that could be you know lean startup framework that they suggest could be using tools like product board which almost do this for you could be the product character framework which is what um, we tend to use for our internal work and and with clients so I'm just check on the check on the questions again, see how we're doing. 
Okay, okay, we can do this idea of bodies in touch. Yeah, let's, uh, so I mean, I, I, rather than getting a bit overwhelmed with questions and doing the talk, I'm going to cover these after, but just checking that everyone is still here. At least we have a few people engaged. <laughs> so it's nice to see. Awesome. So quick water break. So it's a lot of information um, and, you know, not, not going into too much granular detail. Um, but as I said, we will be walking you through this during free workshop, if that's something that an opportunity that you think will be relevant for you. Um, so, sorry, one second, just getting my notes together on this. Oh yeah, here we go, excellent. Okay, cool. So as I said, a lot of information, but um, we're gonna go into detail in, in sort of free calls we're offering and free workshops we're offering as well to help you kick that off, uh, as well as sending out resources to you after this webinar if you are interested on how to run those, those three steps. But I think really important um, to sort of come back to you guys um, and ask you a few really, really important questions because I think even without these frameworks, right, they're not the key things. There are lots of ways to build product, um, but they're really key activities that you should be doing. You know, for example, like how have you adapted over the last one to two weeks? Because it should have been already. What have you done to be identifying and validating these, these big ways, right? these new opportunities? Or how are you preparing yourself? How are you checking the horizon before they may be coming? Again, maybe it's too early, depends on the industry. What have you done to analyze what still makes sense you know, with your product, assumptions you had, what no longer matters? And where are these new opportunities, as I said, or is it too early? Um, and really, really important, again, you know, how are we restructuring our teams to seize these opportunities when they're emerging? Maybe too early now, but it won't be in a couple of weeks. It won't be when we move from quarantine to um, recession economy, let's say. And as I said, if not, why not? The, the urgency, there is now an urgency and it is essential that we apply a proper product process, that we're really looking for new opportunities and we are pursuing those. As I said, previous assumptions do not hold. And if we remain stuck in this death spiral, again, I'm just going to reinforce this point, or if we suddenly find ourselves in this death spiral, or just trying to keep our head above water, you know, how are we going to survive a recession? Because we are in one and that will be around for most likely the rest of 2020. And I think really, really important to remember these sort of two points, on a personal note, these two points, which are very difficult to deal with, but are so important, is something being urgent doesn't mean it is important. You know, immediately we are worrying about shit we've never done remote before. We need the right tools. We need to be organizing our calls, et cetera, et cetera. Those are important, but they are not the most important thing when we're looking a little bit longer term. And really important point, this is sorry, my personal mantra this year is, when it comes to transforming your product organization, like really leading your product team out of what will be a difficult year, nobody is going to come in. Nobody's going to be parachuted in to lead, to lead this change. It has to be you. Right? Nobody is coming to save you and transform your business. Um, you are the one that has to really make this happen. Right? Again, there is urgency. That, and there is a responsibility, not just you know, saving your job, but it's really about the the jobs and livelihoods of your, your team members as well. And again, only these two things matter if you are a product lead. Identifying big ways, where are these new opportunities? Catching them, how are we very quickly testing out whether it makes sense to ride the wave and actually having the right people to, to ensure that we can catch that wave all the way into, sure. Sorry if you're not into surfing, but it might be a little bit confusing. <laughs> Finally, the offer before we jump into Q&A session. So we want, as I said, we want to help you thrive over the coming year. So to do that, obviously we can't teach you everything you need to know in a 30 minute webinar. We will be offering free webinars as much as possible. We're gonna be sending out um, high quality content with our newsletter, providing you with some nice like tools and resources to be using. Um, but we can't, you know, we can't hold your hand in this, but we can help you take the first step. And as I said, we're gonna be offering free workshops for people that we think really fit our, our mold. So people who you know, really want to thrive in uncertainty. Doesn't matter whether you work in digital, physical product company, even if you work in an HR team, if you have problems to solve, you can use these frameworks to solve them. And as I said, people who really take responsibility for the survival of their product teams, you know, take that, that 
the gravity of that very seriously and who have the grit to transform their organizations. Who this is not for, um, these workshops are not for people who like the idea of being an expert or a leader, but are not willing to put the hard work in. You know, people that um, like to make excuses, maybe complain about the situation, complain about things out of their control. Um, but as I said, you need to be able to deal with big problems and big challenges. And as I said, when we're running these workshops, they are limited and we want to make sure that we are working with the right people so that we can really deliver results. You know, running a workshop, um, running multiple workshops, pulling in leadership and, and really shifting your product culture is not easy. It is not an easy thing to do and it takes uh, guts, it takes some bravery to really make that change across your company. So specifically what we're gonna be doing is running free strategy sessions, um, sorry, strategy sessions, <laughs> one-on-one -on -one calls with uh, myself or Felix, my co-founder, where uh, we're going to try and understand your business and see whether there are new, any new opportunities we feel may be emerging there. Secondly, if we think you're a good fit, we'll then be inviting you to run a one-hour design sprint lightning decision jam, uh, which you usually charge 2,000 euros for, to help you validate that opportunity. Um, and we'll talk about the structure. I'm sure questions will come up. What we'll be doing there is, bringing in a few key stakeholders, trying to ideate, you know, what current challenges are you facing? What do we feel might be the best next step to solve that, to move forward? And as I said, our paid product further down the line is if we, if you feel that we deliver value, then we're also offering our paid design sprint in this case for half, uh, sorry, 50% off uh, a full design sprint to run with your team to really move towards actually validating a solution um, over the coming few weeks or months. So one last thing before we jump into questions. Um, this opportunity is only open for one hour. So we're, we will give you a link right now where you can book a time in our, in, um, our calendar. And there are some limited places for this over the next week or two. So let me just double check, see how I can make this work. If you want to, you can book below in one second. Let me work this out. I, ah, okay, so I'm adding a button which you should see here with a big book a strategy call. So as I said, completely free for the call, completely free for the workshop. Um, this is our way of sort of trying to give back to the tech community at the moment. Um, and our long-term offer is, is a design kit really helping you put these things into action. Anyway, right. So I'm gonna leave that link below for the rest of this session. We still have 20 minutes, so let's see what questions come up. And one second, I'm just getting one of those annoying updates on my laptop. And uh, yeah, as I said, let, let's jump through any questions we have. If you need to leave now, completely fine as well. Um, we will send you an email tomorrow with some of the topics covered. I will also, um, you know, if you have any questions as well, feel free to drop us an email. Prick sip of water, and then I'm gonna jump into questions. Yeah, nice, perfect, Felix, thanks for that, big help. How can one unleash themselves from micromanaging product leads? Talk me through, sorry, specifically, Alan, do you mean, so for example, you are managing different product managers. Is he still, he might be, is he still online? Okay, if I don't get a response, let me, Manager is a micromanager. Oh, your manager is a micromanager. So I, th ah, <laughs> very common. I laugh because it's very, very common. So I, th I think this is my biggest learning. I think the last three years or so is that, you know, one thing I've always, my background is again, working with my own startup coming from smaller, very early stage startups where you don't have much bullshit and bureaucracy. So in that context, it's generally easier to, to bring about sort of big change, right? As I said, you know, if you're in a um, eight person startup now, you can basically shift everything in an hour in a quick meeting. And I think the big challenge is, is really getting generally a non-product person to realize that they're wrong <laughs> on certain things. So there's, there's two parts to that. And it generally comes down to an empathy gap. So generally what happens is if you are micromanaged, and this is very common in Germany, I don't know why, but I'm not even gonna get into that. If you are micromanaged, what tends to happen is the person that is defining the tasks is never provided with clear feedback that their idea might not have been a great idea, 
what I mean by that is this. Let's take an example. So bossy CEO, usually a male, will say, let's build feature X because our competitor's doing that. You try and push back, they shut you down. And now because you've built the thing, and the CEO is not because you're pushed into just building lots of things, you aren't able to then come back to them and say, look, you requested this thing, here were the results. So ideally, um, again, this is why we actually really recommend the, the design sprint process. Ideally, what we do, and one trick that has worked for me before is that you, you need to show very clearly, you need to sneak in analytics. <laughs> so, you know, if you're really under pressure, the only step that can work is to build whatever's requested as quickly as possible, come back to your manager and say, look, I tracked the results of this and we didn't see the results expected. Not in an aggressive way, just purely, look, here's the data. Um, what do we do with this? You know, look for them for, for the answer because they may not have one. And some people will be very unreasonable about this. So you may get, um, how do you describe this? You know, you may get the blame put on the developers for not doing it properly, the designer for doing a crap job of it, or you for, you know, not delivering, not doing what they wanted exactly. Um, but the best advice I can give you is uh, two things, is, is immediately try and just show one case where the feature has not delivered value. And again, in the current climate, even your, your boss, if they're, even if they're very unreasonable, should be, is understanding the need to build something that's valuable, right? So, so that is a clear problem they need to address. Second approach, and again, why I'm really pushing the, the lightning decision jam initially to align everyone on the sort of direction strategy. Secondly, that design sprint process is so that you can get everyone in the room and shared around the vision right, of what we are trying to achieve. Because usually then they are able to step out, right? Your manager won't micromanage you because they know that you know that you're clear on the objective, you know, more revenue or more active users, for example, or, um, you know, more revenue for whatever specific feature or product line that you are, um, you're managing. So, yeah, so two things, short term, make sure that you are able to show them data and say, hey, this didn't have a big impact. Second thing is um, really running a, an effective kickoff meeting to just say, look, this is direction we're taking because you show that you're a leader in that, in that situation, you show that you can, move the pieces around, you should see a lot more uh, autonomy given to you. I mean, a lot of the problem is that most leaders don't set clear objectives. So they micromanage because they themselves are not clear about what they're trying to do. So you need to come in and, and, and provide that framework for them with the, with the lightning decision jam or a full design sprint. Hopefully that helps. Um, next question, Felix, awesome. Uh, sorry, from Claudia or Claudia, how do you, yeah, thanks Alan for that. Uh, it's super common. <laughs> Super cool. I mean, I could do a workshop on that alone. Uh, Claudia, how do you do a successful workshop remotely? So, again, because we have to run the full workshop to sort of show you how this works in detail, there are two options here. One is um, I would suggest booking a, a call with us and see whether we can run a workshop with you. Again, there's no pressure on, on payment for this. We're really trying to do this in a generous way at the moment. The other thing is we were, and this is relevant for everyone here, no worries, Alan, is um, I already realized that, that seeing this in action will be really important. So what we're gonna be doing is next week running a lightning decision jam um, as a webinar. So we will be taking a, a problem uh, from a specific company and actually running that live uh, with everyone attending. So actually, you know what would be great? If everyone, if anyone is interested in that, please just give a quick thumbs up or, Yes, that sounds great. And then we will make sure that that happens. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, Claudia, I mean, generally, generally speaking, it, it's a lot more preparation and using the right collaborative tools. Doesn't matter what you use, whether that is Figma or Miro or Mural, there's lots of cool tools you can use. Obviously, you need screen share, you need, you need, you know, whatever video conference service, you need to be able to screen share and have enough people on there, et cetera. Awesome. Okay, right. So that is a good confirmation of that. We will do that then, definitely. Um, awesome. We'll probably do the same time next week. Um, sorry, what was I saying? Yeah, so I mean, the tools are there now. I mean, two, three years ago, it would have been pretty tricky to do this. Now it is simply like, do you have the right um, framework? Have you prepared? Do you have the tools in place? And one thing I'll be doing in the call tomorrow, uh, Cloudy, is I'll send you a video, actually, YouTube tutorial on running a lightning decision jam yourself. 
you can sort of see this in action already. Uh, everyone else as well that's interested, you can you can see that in action there. Um, yeah, that's it. So as I said, we'll, we'll sort of show you the theory in our email tomorrow, and then next week we'll actually run a live live session with you guys. Cool, Magdalena. It is not too early to come up with ideas. Uh, is it not too early to come up with ideas? We don't know. Yeah, I mean, this this is this is the big question at the moment. So I think um, the this the really important thing is to ask, you know, what will be permanent? As I said, there's no point building a, you know, I mean, there is because remote. Let's let's say you suddenly just go, oh my god, like let's let's build remote tools out of nowhere. Like there is going to be a trend there that's already been there, right? It's been increasing. It will probably probably be more remote sorry more teams working remotely or at least having um you know a few weeks a year or whatever but what we could see is actually maybe there's no change or maybe companies let teams work remotely one or two days a week but that obviously doesn't mean you know the companies will work the same they'll use slack and email they're not gonna shift all of their culture and you know hr onto remote tools running uh you know remote retreats etc so I don't think you're going to see the shift towards like how full remote companies work, like um, you know Basecamp, for example. There will be some trends, but I think, as I said, one thing that, that um, you know, to be very transparent with our, our strategy, even I think that people are in lockdown mode at the moment, not just physically, but, but as businesses, right? It's trying to um, close the dorms, ride out this initial storm, and then afterwards. We need to try and think. Okay, what's the you know what's the the other world here? So I, I'm talking at the moment about the quarantine economy and, and the post quarantine economy, where people are back in the office, but there is fundamental change. There is behaviour change. There are belief changes. You know, what's the implication of maybe um, universal healthcare coming into the US? That may be a prospect. I mean, look at Trump is essentially running a socialist government at the moment by pumping six trillion dollars into the economy. So what are the impacts that we've got? No idea. But we can start, if we're, again, if we're observing, if we're keeping our eyes towards the horizon and blocking out time to make sure we are doing that rather than, you know, looking just at the day-to-day -day and the urgent, then we'll start seeing some trends emerge, if not already. You know, I see on just being on LinkedIn, a lot, where we do most of our marketing, just you can see some shifts in behavior and thinking and beliefs. And, and I think just staying quite sort of open to that. And, and you're right, though, not committing maybe too early to certain things makes a huge amount of sense. Yes, Felix. Yeah, the, yeah, there'll be some interesting changes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it'd be wrong to say we know what's going to happen because we don't and we don't know what people's reaction will be and how that triggers knock on behavior. Uh, yeah, we, we just don't know about it. So how do you think the current positive impact of lockdowns on the environment will bounce back in the future to reshape businesses approach to sustainability? I mean, honestly, I can give you my opinion on this, but I don't think I would be the right person to ask. I'm definitely not an, in any way an expert on sustainability. I like sustainability, but um, I mean, my thoughts initially on that are it's really hard because I think companies will always be, most will be focused on the bottom line. I think that there will be some interesting changes on how people have changed their beliefs. You know, for example, it's not, um, I think everyone's realized we're pretty much the same regardless of like nationality, race, gender, et cetera. Everyone's sort of in this together. And I think there'll be some really positive outcomes of that. As I said, you know, what happens if universal healthcare comes in? Um, what is the simple impact of like neighbors working together, singing together on balconies in Italy? Like, these types of things are really, really interesting. But I think on terms of sustain sustainability, I mean, there'll be a little, Obviously, probably more people working remotely, but I, I'm fairly sure people, companies will just shift back to previous behavior. Maybe a lot more founders working on you know, social connection or environmental concerns, right? Because you see what happens with a, a let's call it a, a mild um, coronavirus. Not to say that, that it, it, it's a very serious thing, but I you know, imagine bubonic plague or something with a death rate of 40%. Anyway, my point is that when you know people see the gravity of this situation what happens when when climate change really kicks in, kicks in for certain countries 
Uh, anyway, sorry, uh, I'm not sure it'd be a huge help on that. If anyone else has any thoughts, though, feel free to add comments on here. Uh, Alan532 said, how do you move to a validated idea in a couple of days if it's a major software development? I mean, this is the reason actually why um, we are really pushing these workshop formats is it is almost impossible when we start kicking off a project without a proper framework for saying, okay, what's the broad challenge we're trying to go for? What specific, which specific problems are we trying to solve? And then going to solution. If we don't have that framework, we immediately jump to solution. It's a natural human thing to start thinking about, you know, we, I know we have this idea um, and you already think about the complexity, particularly as a product manager or developer, you're thinking, like, how are we going to do this? Like, how do we avoid technical debt, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the process, the framework, right, the lightning decision jam or the full design sprint is, if anything, more important for big projects. Because you need to make sure that if you're placing a bet on something, that it is the right bet to take. It doesn't matter if you already committed time. Objectively, it doesn't matter. We have a psychological bias where we don't want to feel we've wasted time on something. But so it's really important, again, really important right now to run this workshop at the Lightning Decision Jam with your stakeholders to just, even if you know that it, we may need to change, just to be crystal clear with everyone in that, um, you know, in your company, all of your stakeholders, like, okay, this is the objective. Are we? Are we moving towards that effectively with our current solution? Maybe the answer is no, and therefore you may have to, it may justify then a, a pivot with your product. Um, also specifically, if you're working on a, a, you know, maybe you're working on a major like, I don't know, banking tool, for example, um, and you've, you've validated that you're on the right thing. I mean, as a good product organization, you should then be breaking it down into separate areas, right? So where's that product team focused on maybe acquisition? or activation, right? Maybe another team on retention, another one on revenue generation. And those initiatives that they're running, right? Saying, you know, we want to increase revenue with feature X, that still requires an effective framework, right? You're breaking it down into smaller teams. Um, thanks, Moed, as well. Good luck, may have already gone, but anyway, thank you for joining. Jasmine, let's see. Um, sorry, I'm gonna cover Darius's his one because he, he sent this earlier. And then I'll take the last question from Jasmine. How do you manage difficulties in understanding product storyboards with developers? Usually any issues, standard we've taken to show directly in person. Specifically, uh, okay, so this is a question of really remote organization um, and team size adds into it. So I think if you're talking visually, if you already have UI design, it should be tools like Figma really where you have the design on there, developers at a very early stage should be commenting and really engaging with that before it ever gets to any sort of final process. Um, in terms of though, just aligning people, I mean, this is where remote, you do need really effective remote meetings and structure is, I mean, really you need a kickoff meeting on any specific feature you're working on. So I think now rather than relying on like one sprint meeting per week and trying to cram everything in because you're not having those, you know, walking past a desk or lunch conversations with people, everything, people have no context. So all the ideas are new ideas. So one thing that's worked for me before is, you know, breaking down any features you're looking to work on by um, running, you know, really quick, high, high impact, like can be 15, 20 minutes with one or two developers just to break down a task a little bit more so that when you get to your sprint planning, maybe it's 30 minutes or an hour, everyone sort of knows what's going on. I think that's a really important point with remote. Uh, big difference is you need to, yeah, you need to really over communicate and remember that, that people aren't in the office, so they don't have these passing conversations, passing ideas. Uh, sorry, I'm going to do then two more, uh, two more, Tobias and then Yasmin. You've had a lot of ideas in the market for such a client discussion or database of actual user base. Uh, this is, I mean, this is a big topic. Um, so I think it's, this is where the minimal viable product is contentious, right? We need to make sure that we've validated clearly that something has worked. And I think when we talk about mock-ups, if they are done in a realistic way, so talking digital, so if we have, uh, you know, even if it's just screens connected together with InVision, it takes you know, a minute to connect those screens together. If it feels real to the customer, then it gives you a good indication of how people might use it. Um, 
However, never, never, never beats actual user behavior. And this is why we need really fast cross-functional teams when it comes to actually executing. Because, um, you know, again, people may love a design, but it doesn't mean they're going to come back and use it every day or every week, or they'll fundamentally pay for it. So the best data is always live data. Next best thing is, is not live. Next best thing from a prototype is going to be some sort of survey or user interview. Uh, cheers, Darius. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Hopefully that answers your question before you end. <laughs> uh, awesome. And then final question. So I'm going to have to take one more. That, sorry, I'm just going to then have to take Benoit. Sorry, Yasmin. I will, I will get back to yours over email after this. Final question from Benoit. So I'm working in the tourism industry. Oof, yeah, it's really tough. Sorry, I feel for you. Already set in part-time to save costs as well as my team. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's, it's really tough. I think this kind of situation. Um, I mean, one thing, this is really not product related. One thing that I found really effective, you know, thinking when my first business closed, you know, particularly when it's your business, you lose a lot of sense of purpose. You know, things that have really helped me are stoicisms. It's really sort of ancient Greek belief around everything is happening to you for a reason. Everything is an opportunity. So the mindset is really actually the key foundation. And this when I published my book last year, really, you know, it's not just about product process. It's you need to be calm and mindful and, and very rational uh, and robust right? When, it, when, when challenges come, because they always will in product teams. Specifically, though, I think, you know, best thing to book a call with me, because I'd be very, very happy to help um, see where, you know, how, how we could help there. There's definitely things to be doing. Um, I think if we get a better understanding of like what your company does and, and then, you know, what maybe we could, we could um, what opportunity could be pursued, you know, building client relationships already. Uh, doing something we're doing, you know, offering free value with a webinar, this kind of thing can be quite effective. Awesome. Anyway, thank you for all of the questions. So I think next steps in that, tomorrow we're going to be sending you an email just with a, the full webinar. You obviously don't want to watch it again, but I will give you a quick recap. I'll attach a couple of resources as well on that. And um, yeah, that's it really. Thank you for, for sticking with me for an hour. Uh, hopefully it was entertaining hopefully it was useful as well and as i said the real value is going to be in the strategy calls we're doing the workshops we're going to run with you guys and next wednesday we will now thank you for the feedback we will be doing a uh, live workshop so if you want to also if you want to uh, tomorrow if you want to be part of that and actually like help me run it then more than welcome cheers eric thanks so much for the time thanks magdalena thank you tobias Thank you, Benoit. Again, book a call with me, Benoit. More than happy to help. Darius already gone. Cheers for that. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy. I'm going to stop the webinar. We'll send an email tomorrow. Cheers, guys, and have a good evening. Stuck in quarantine. <laughs>